right, good morning, good morning, Word of Faith, good morning. It is really good to be with you again. I'm Pastor Matthew Cuddis, I'm the youth pastor here at Word of Faith Christian Center, and I'm going to be hosting this morning with um, some very special people, obviously, and I'd like to introduce them quickly before you go, and while I'm introducing them, please go ahead and tag and share, and as soon as they've introduced themselves, I'm going to explain how you can do that. But I want to welcome my beautiful wife, Helena. Michael, hello there. Good morning. And then also, uh, we've added, as you can see, you might see at the bottom of the screen of the white shot, my daughter Ella. You want to say good morning to everybody? Say hi. That's my daughter Ella. And there's a reason we've got them on here this morning. Uh, good morning, Soraya. Good to have you with us. And um, uh, well done for being the first one to comment this morning. Please go ahead and tag and share. Share this all around. Get people into church, onto the live streaming. Um, as you know, 8 o'clock, this is our live streaming service. 10 o'clock, we've got also, you can come to church. We allowed up to 250 people. But this is the best way to evangelize and get people into the service. We're looking forward to this morning's uh, ministry by Pastor Richard. But in the meantime, go ahead and tag and share. And the way you tag people is you push the little at sign. And uh, the little at sign, you, you type a letter, whatever, and then all their names come up. You tag them, tag them, tag them. And I uh, just want to also say good morning, Cindy. All the way from Western Cape. Okay, I'll take it to you on holiday. Lekker for oh, wow. Awesome. Great stuff. <laughs> so please, that, that, that's another thing. Let us know where you are watching from. We love watch, seeing where people are watching from. As you heard, Sunny's in the Western Cape. We've got people who watch from Wales, Australia, <laughs> all over. But this morning as we're hosting, as we're starting this morning, we've got a few announcements that we want to make. But specifically, we would like to make a special note and a special announcement uh, advert or let me say announcement that parents please know we have got children's church running at both services 8 a.m and 10 a.m which is really really awesome so you can bring your children children of all ages we've got the um, program running now for kingdom kids and my wife actually runs that and i'm going to let her just explain exactly the details of how you can bring your children and where to come when you come to church at the 8 and 10 a.m service Thanks, love. I think uh, you look like you on the beach. I think we, we are, this is like the, what the weather's like in, in Port Elizabeth. Somebody sits with a jacket, they're all cold, and the next person sits like they're all warm. <laughs> um, so Children's Church, yes, is happening. Uh, we open at 8 and 10 a.m., like you said. And, um, you know, it's really important for us to bring our children um, to Children's Church, that they can grow up and learn to love Jesus, and that he'll be there with them forever. And um, we've asked Ella as well to come join us today, and she's got a few cool things that she wants to share about how Children's Church has changed her life. And I know we've seen the fruits in our kids' lives of coming to Children's Church. Um, you know, I think it's important for those who are watching to know that we do sanitize, we all wear masks, we all have social distancing, those things are important, but most, most important are the values that are being instilled in our children's lives. And Michael, you are now a children's and youth leader here at Word of Faith Christian Center, and we just want to thank Michael, because one of the things Children's Church has ta taught Michael is how to get up early in the morning. <laughs> As you can see, the guy's still, like all of us still waking up, I'm sure, and all of you are having your coffee right now. <laughs> I think I'm fairly awake at this point. Okay, great stuff. But yeah, uh, Children's Church, yeah, definitely. It's one of those things where I don't think I would be where I am without it. Sure. Definitely. Uh, yeah, it definitely has taught me a lot of confidence, more than anything, I can tell you that much. Uh, it also forced me to interact with people that weren't from the same walk of life as me, which I think is really good. Because it means that you are able to figure out how to relate to other people better. Am I not right? Absolutely. And yeah. that's why you're a leader today. You, yeah. as, you, as you just said now, you different walks of life, different walks of faith. Mm -hmm. and, and what in your, if I may ask Mark, in your current life, how have you applied what you've learned in going to children's church, coming to youth, how have you applied that to your life? Well, well, I make sure I, I do my best, sometimes I forget, but I make sure to at least read a chapter or two of the Bible before I go to sleep every single night, if I can help it. Um, so that idea of having like a verse or chapter of the day, yeah, that, that 
sort of I start by. Um, I make sure that I keep in contact with people, because that's one thing you learn is you make friends. You need to keep in contact with them. Uh, you also learn to be patient with others. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a big thing for me. The other thing is I learned I don't always have to win or be right, which really helps. Don't always have to win. Because huh? in children's church, you know what it's like. You play those games, and you know you won but for the 10th time in a row, but, you, but then they let you lose. So that somebody else can... <laughs> and I see there's uh, Marion Litter is on. Now, I'm going to ask Ella a question now. But before I ask Ella my daughter a question, I see uh, Marion Litter and my mom, funny enough. Marion Litter, I remember children's ministry. I remember finishing children's church. The children's church leaders jumped up for joy and had a party the day I finished children's church. So they thought, Craig, Matthew Cullis has left the building. Yeah. <laughs> That, and then Mario Nita was like, no. And she grabbed me and she pulled me straight back in. Do you know that I became a connect leader? Church, I don't know if you know this. So often I see young, uh, different people say, oh, I can't become a connect leader. I'm too busy. I'm too young. I don't know. 13 years old, I was grabbed and made a children's church leader and connect leader. 13 years old. My parents or my sister used to drop me off at the Dupasani's house. And I used to run a connect group of 10 and 11 year olds. <laughs> And it worked. And, you know, the thing is that it's, it's also, like you said, grew confidence. And, but just the, the interesting thing is every Sunday morning we were at Children's Church. And I, I like what you said, different walks alive, because Mario and Lita will remember this. We used to get on a bus uh, for Children's Church. And we would drop, we, when the new building started, we would get dropped off at the old building at Harold Road and have Children's Church there. And I tell you what, there were children. And, and I mean, the, the South, we weren't yet the new South Africa. But yet there was this bus. Uh, it was a Rainbow Nation bus. And it was lovely. There were kids from all different areas, different cultures, races, everything, on a bus singing together to children's church. It was the most amazing thing. It was lots of fun. Now, Ella, what is, what is coming to children's church uh, taught you and how has it helped you, my girl? Whenever I see someone bullying another person or a sibling bullying me. It, what's it taught you? It's taught me that I must stand up for other people and I must stand up for myself also. Sure. Wow. That is incredible. And for such, and how old are you now, Ella? I'm turning 10 in November. <laughs> now, by the way, I, I did know that. I am the father. I should know that. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to show you all. This is a young girl of nine. You know, if young children of nine years old can grow confidence and, and learn confidence. Um, you know, that's why children's church is so important. And it teaches us good habits, like coming to church on a Sunday morning. Now, just what, one of the things we'd like to quickly also advertise and just mention is that all the connect group leaders on Tuesday evening, we are going to be having a children's, ah, children's church, <laughs> a connect leader, I'm saying children's church at the moment. Connect Leaders Meeting. We are going to, so all the Connect Leaders, we are having Connect Leaders Meeting on Tuesday evening at quarter to seven on Zoom. There's a Zoom link. We'll send it to you. You can also go and see on the Word of Faith page. Uh, we'll be um, having a, a Zoom Connect Leaders Meeting on Tuesday evening where we'll be discussing some of the latest things coming up, up for Connect Groups and really exciting news about Faith Fellowship uh, in July. And we, we, we need all of you to come on there. It's really exciting. Pastor Richard's going to be sharing his vision. And also the other thing is because it's a Zoom meeting, it'll be 40 minutes long. It's only a 40-minute meeting. I mean, isn't that incredible? I remember Connect Leaders meetings going on for ages, but now 40 minutes on Tuesday evening um, where we'll be discussing some upcoming things and some vision, some exciting things from Pastor Richard. Now, quick question I want to ask everybody on the line. On the line. Please listen to this. I, I want you to answer this question. I've asked, the, I've asked this question before many years, uh, many months ago, I should say. But um, at what age did you start, at what age did you choose to serve the Lord? First time you chose to serve the Lord, how <laughs> old were you? The, the first day you decided, I want to follow Jesus, how old were you? Babes, how old were you? Oh, golly. Um, I was probably 
I think I was about nine, eight or nine when I asked Jesus to live in my heart. Um, I would go to church um, with, yeah, my mom would take us to church. And I was about 10 years old when I got baptized. And I knew wow. exactly what um, I was doing and saying. And, you know, yeah. Was that the question? That was, that was a good answer. Eight, nine. Um, Mike? I know this seems like a bit of a cop-out, but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I, I think, uh, I mean, well, I was born into the church, uh, but I think that the first time I really sincerely did something about it was, I think it was, I was five or something. Sure. I think I was at a holiday club. Um, I know it was at a holiday club, but I can't remember what age it was. I actually remember a holiday club. I think it was the one you're talking about where you came uh, forward, you gave your heart to the Lord. Years ago. And it was such a genuine... It was, it was before the Mythbusters one. <laughs> so I think it was like 2008. The Mythbusters was a cool one. Yeah, that was fun. And we now have lots of fun. And Ella, what age did you decide to start following Jesus? Six. Six. Wow. Sure. And you, you decided on your own. For me, it was three. I remember being three years old, my sister Debbie, uh, Debbie, she sat me down in the bedroom, she explained to me who Jesus was, and you know, as you were saying now, babe, it's, it's a, it's, it was like I actually understood what she was saying. As a three-year-old, when she spoke to me about this man named Jesus dying on the cross and raising again, I actually understood. It was like the Holy Spirit actually spoke to me as a three, I completely understood, and I don't actually remember ever needing to make the decision ever again after that because I knew what I was doing. I knew I was, when I went to children's church, I knew what this was about. It was like the Holy Spirit really spoke to me as a young boy. Now, please answer the question. I see, oh, I see Bernadette Shovel said something. I don't know, babes, if you remember, Bernadette Shovel mentioned Tyler. Tyler was a young boy in our children's church that unfortunately, sadly, he passed away two years ago. But Tyler was one of our faithful children's church attendees and he gave his life to Jesus he, he loved the Lord. He loved being in children's church, passed away. And I remember we had his funeral here in the church. But, you know, he's with the Lord right now. He's serving the Lord. He's in heaven. And, you know, the important thing, people that are watching and, and, and families alike, the, you know, this is why children's church is so important. As you just heard now, most people who give their life to the Lord, and even stats have proven that most people that give their lives to the Lord make that decision before the age of 13 in their primary school age. They say that the longer, the older children get, the older people get before they make the decision, unfortunately, it, it, it becomes less. Um, people are far less likely to start serving the Lord after the age of 18 if they've never made the decision before, which is why it's so important. Okay, to ask Ella. Ella, why should children come to children's church? So that they can learn to be, one day when they grow up, they can be good Christians. And good hosts on, ch on live ch on church, eh? At, on live church, eh, Ella? <laughs> give me five, Ella. This is the youngest host, by the way, we've ever had on a Sunday morning. Can we give her a big round of applause? <laughs> You've done really excellent. Even Auntie Debbie is saying, well done, Ella. It's so nice. A lot of people have mentioned she looks so beautiful. And Children's Church is my favorite place to be, Pastor Mariana. Pastor Mariana taught us how to do Children's Church. But anyway, we're going to open up in prayer as we're about to go into a time of worship. And Father, this morning, we want to thank you, Lord. Lord, in fact, your word said that unless you have faith like one of these children, you cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. And, and for theirs is the kingdom. And Lord, this morning, I thank you that, Lord, as we come before you, we come with faith, like a childlike faith, Father God. And Lord, I pray that each and every person that's watching on this live will be touched, changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Please continue to share, share this as we go into a time of worship. You don't want others to miss out. This is going to be an amazing, amazing service. God bless you. Enjoy, this, enjoy the worship. Good morning, church. Won't you stand with us this morning in the presence of God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh Father. We bless your name, Jesus. We enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, Father. And right now, I just want to encourage you.
encourage you to just take the next few moments to just forget about everything else, all the cares of this world, and just fix your eyes on Jesus. I will sing of your goodness, I will sing of your love, though the seasons come quick, you have always been enough, though the night may get dark, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love, you are good.
of sharing, rose out sharing, he is Yahweh, the righteous son, he is Yahweh, the three in one, he is Yahweh, creator God, he is now, creator God, he is Yahweh, the great I am, he is Yahweh, the Lord of all, he is Yahweh, he is the rose of sharing, rose of sharing.
Amen, amen, hallelujah, amen. We believe that, Lord, you are more than enough for us. And this morning, Father, as we hear, your word says, where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of us, Father. So this morning, Lord, we say, you are more than enough. You are more than enough. I I can have a bank account with zero. I can have nothing behind my name, but Lord, you are more than enough in every situation. When I think everything is down and out and finished, Lord, you are more than enough. And Lord, I thank you for your love, your grace, your peace, and your resurrection power this morning, Father God, that each and every person that's here, Lord, each and every person that comes into your presence, Lord, we just thank you for an open window of heaven, that Lord, each person will just feel your presence in Jesus' mighty name. And I just declare the perfect peace of God right now that surpasses all understanding upon each and every person that's here in your presence, but including those who are watching live worshiping you this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Are you blessed this morning? Amen. Let's just give the Lord a big thanks. Praise offering. Amen. Hallelujah. You can take a seat. As you're taking a seat, I just want to make a a special welcome. You know, um, my wife mentioned a few names. I'm going to let her have an opportunity to mention it now. But I asked a question earlier. And how many of you gave your life to Jesus in the audience? And those of you who are online, please answer this question. The question I want to ask the online audience is, at what age did you first decide to serve Jesus? At what age, what, what was the age that you first decided to ask God into your heart? And then all the uh, people who are watching, or sorry, all the people who are here in the service, well done for coming. We can have up to 250 with social distancing and masks and all these things, but I want to ask, how many of you in the service gave your heart to Jesus before the age of 13? Raise of hands. How many of you made that decision before the age of 13? Show it nice and high. You said, hey, I want to follow Jesus. Wow, there's a lot of people. And after the age of 13? And after the age of 13? <laughs> Anybody after the age of 20? Oh. Okay. Awesome stuff. Fantastic. Well, one of the things we wanted to, we mentioned this morning, we're talking about is Children's Church. Elena made a, I'm going to let her mention a couple of names, but I just want to especially, um, I saw the Diakas coming. Where are the Diakas? Um, Johanna and Debbie, well done. Brought your children to Children's Church. Excellent stuff. There's a family <laughs> serving the Lord. I see your one boy is with you there. And um, we've got Children's Church running with social distancing, masks and everything. I see Debbie, say, I see there are people answering, 20, my mom says 27, praise the Lord, mom, you made that decision at 27, just before, or not just before I was born, before Debbie was, I don't know, and Debbie says 10 years old, um, she gave her heart to the Lord, but babes, you had a few people you wanted to mention that are in the service that come from Children's Church. And yes, well, I'm, I'm just so chuffed to be sitting here and seeing people in church, if I think back mm. to where we were this time last year, and I see all these Facebook memories coming up of of things we were doing in isolation. It's just so awesome to see people walking to the children's church. I wanna just let the parents who are watching know that there's lots of space. We have not at all reached any capacity, I promise you. So if you wanna start bringing your children back to children's church, bring them at 8 a.m. is a great opportunity. There's lots of space. I think, yeah, there's lots of space. But it just warms my heart to see the likes of, of Danielle um, here as well, who grew up in children's church, yes. um, who, who has just flourished in life, who's doing so well. And I just, I look at the, at the top there, we've got young men who, who are coming and sitting in the service, who have also chosen to serve in children's mm. church and are coming to get involved. And that really, really warms my heart. You know, seeing, um, seeing Debbie and, and Johan with little Keegan there, um, you know, it's okay if your kids don't want to go back into the class yet. I mean, so much has changed. Just bring them. If they sit with you in church, it's okay. We have a mother's room um, in the back that's open and available. We also have Connection Cafe with a little playground in the, in the background. So bring your kids. It's, it's good to start coming back to church. And I want to add that it affects every part of your life. This is not just about coming to church and filling the spaces in church and the chairs. You know what? We've seen young people go out of children's church and it's affected their whole lives. And today they're successful men and women thanks to being in children's church, growing, learning the right values, morals, 
and faith. Get into the word from a young age. You just look at Daniel now, who's, uh, who's just gotten married to, to John Ray, and they're a success. We see Michael sitting over here, who's now studying, who's just finished matric. Um, I, there's so many names and people I can mention in the service. The Petersons, whose sons just moved to Cape Town, you know, <laughs> who's, who's also serving the Lord, but is studying in Cape Town. I, I'm excited about your son, by the way. Lance, studying to become a, a computer game programmer. It, that's so cool. That was like when we were kids. Whoa, you just want to be a student. That's so cool. But anyway, Pastor Manny. Thank you. Thank you. Bom dia. Como estás? Estou bem. Bom dia. Don't be rude. I'm speaking to you. Como estás? Obrigado. Yeah. Muito obrigado. Yeah, no, now some of you are looking at my curly hair, eh? my olive skin, and thinking, is he from Mozambique? <laughs> no. I wanted to, okay, let's say, say with me like to say, bon dia. Como estás? All right, so, bon dia. Como estás? Then you say, estao ben. A little bit more easier on the ear now. Right, so today I want to speak about obviously giving, but the reason why I did that, I'll explain to you later on. Let's read the scripture quickly. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So there will, be no, there will be enough food in the temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the heavens for you, the windows of heaven for you, I will, and um, I have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. The other version starts off with, test me in this, says the Lord, Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Now we normally associate giving with the sacrifice. You know, we, we talk about giving in a sacrificial. But I want to also say that God is a progressive God in terms of revelation. So he takes you through things step by step. Like I said, bon dia, como estar? Estou bem. Somebody shouted out, obrigado. But when we went over it slowly, you started, it was easy on the tongue. Now, I haven't taught you what that means. We'll do that in lesson two in about three or four weeks. <laughs> but the point is, after I said it, and you said it back, and we did it a few times, it was easier. So if I go on to something else in a little bit more in-depth, you'll be more ready for that. And God in nature is, His revelation, He, he revealed His, His self to us in revelation, um, in, in progressive revelation. So giving is not just about the sacrifice behind it. But when we actually understand the way God has taught us, we understand that there is a huge principle behind this. And that is exactly what the whole of creation is sort of, what's the right word? There's like an undercurrent, there's a subcurrent that the whole of creation buzzes to. And that's seed and harvest. If you think about Genesis, the Bible speaks about Seed and harvest. Where does the chicken come from? Okay, we're not going to have that argument now about that. But where does the chicken come from? From the hen. And the hen lays eggs, the eggs, lay, the eggs uh, hatch, and then there's chickens. And you understand there's a cycle. Um, um, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we harvest, um, when we harvest uh, grain from, the, from the, the field, same thing. There's seed within that. And you, you, you know, a, a farmer thinks differently to us. We just eat uh, um, uh, an orange, and what do we do when we're eating that orange? We split the pips out. The farmer thinks, hey, keep those pips, keep the seed one side, because we need to plant that again. But the whole of creation has the subcurrent of seed and harvest, seed and harvest. And so when God, when God introduced us to giving, he wasn't just introducing us to the sacrifice of giving, but he was actually opening up to us what the entire creation actually runs on. 
So when we give, we actually are getting into a place where we are getting, God is introducing to us a consistent pattern of giving. A consistent pattern. He's introducing to us sowing and reaping on that level. And as he goes on with, with revel, uh, revel, revelation, by, uh, with it being progressive in nature, it goes from one stage to the next stage to the next stage. Now, I want to say this quickly. Tithing is extremely, extremely important. However, it is the foundation, and it's, if we, are there any lecturers or university students here? Okay, let's, are there any third year or honors students? Not today. Okay, there's an honor student. Imagine, are you an honor student? Third year. So imagine if you got into lectures this year and they started off with first year subjects. How would you feel? You'd feel confused. I think you'd feel a little bit done in. And so, just like it is with school, we have, um, I almost gave my age away there. <laughs> I almost said sub A. Uh, at least, <laughs> yeah, I come from that era, sub A, sub B, <laughs> standard one. But imagine if you get to matric and they start with grade one lessons. Does it make, would it make sense? So, so tithing is the basis. And, and I was chatting with, with Pastor Richard early on. And you know, there's an argument out there. Tithing is not New Testament. Tithing is Old Testament and blah, 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 blah. Yes and no. Do you know why there isn't too much of specifically using the word tithing in the New Testament? Not because it is a done away with thing, but it is elementary. It's giving 101 tithing. What does tithe mean? Tithe means? God's not calling us to stay on a 10%, 10% level. Tithing is our foundation. It's 10%. Giving 101. God wants us to go up to the 20%, to the 30%, to the 50%, to the 70%, to the point where you are, when the Lord says, brother, I need you to give your third part to that Sister, I need you to give your extra, your house, your holiday house to that, that brother or that sister or whatever. You are ready to do that because that's, when you think about New Testament teaching, New Testament teaching is far beyond the 10%. And that's the only reason why the New Testament is as, can I use the word silent for lack of a better word, is as silent as it is about the 10% because by that point, we should have progressed on. If you look at the blueprint of the X church they were selling houses and bringing everything so that, every, so that the work of the ministry can go on. Now, I want to say this to you. If you want to tithe, absolutely correct. Do so. But don't do it religiously. Do it because you're saying, Lord, this is my ceiling, and I'm going to give 10%. But to those who want to move on to third year university, honors, PhD, masters, and you see the fruit of that. Start to test me in this. That's what the scripture says. The Lord is saying, test me in this. And you start seeing the fruit. So you lift your ceiling higher. 30%, 40%, 50%. I could go on and on about this, but I'm going to say, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to say, you determine, look, you determine what kind of inflow you get. Speak to any farmer and any farmer will tell you. We were farming chickens for a little while and we bought a hundred, hundred day old chicks. So we expected a hundred birds at the end of the day, in, at the end of the, the six week process to sell out. If, but we couldn't buy a hundred, a hundred birds and expect to sell 200 birds. It's simple, simple, basic maths. So you determine how far this is going to go. So right now, in the same atmosphere, I want to ask you to take out your tithe, your offering, your giving. And I want to challenge you just a little bit. Challenge you. Like the scripture says, like God says, test me in this and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven. 
So we can either choose to stay at, at Giving 101 or we can move on. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as people have already and are right now preparing their seed, oh God, I pray that you would give them the revelation that they have the power within them to lift the, seed, the, the ceiling on seed and harvest, oh God. Their harvest is directly uh, uh, linked to the seed, oh God. So as they start to shift away from religiously sticking to 10%, oh God, and they start to test you in this, I pray, oh God, that you would open up the windows of heaven over their finances, over their families, over their work situations in Jesus' mighty name, over their neighborhoods right now, oh God. I pray that just like you, you like the church of X, oh God, has signs, miracles, and wonders in all the atmospheres, all the facets of their lives, oh God, was released. I pray that that would be released, oh God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thanks, Pastor Max. Amen. We just want to make a special welcome to those of you here for the first time in church. Uh, we love to meet new people, and we would like to give you a treat on the house at our Connection Cafe next door. So all those that are here for the first time at Word of Faith Christian Center in the service, please just raise your hand. Our ushers would like to also hand you something. Who's here for the first time? Show of hands. Let's give them a nice warm welcome. There's a family at the back over there. And um, this has been wonderful. There's a, another young lady over there. Fantastic. Very, very big welcome to you. You know, this is one of the most amazing things. And I really want to also say at youth on Friday nights, we, we've got so many young people. The young people are really, really hungry. We had um, Bill Hammond prophesied a few weeks ago about how there's going to be a revival amongst the young people, amongst the youth. And man, Friday nights have been uh, popping at the seams. We had a hundred and... 60 odd here on Friday night. It was huge. So many young people just hungry for the Lord coming. The connect groups are, are growing. We've got, a, we've got one of those good problems where we're praying, Lord, send the workers. Um, and just want to also make a special welcome to um, the Barnards. I see Niku's in the service this morning. Welcome, Niku. So good to see you. Amazing testimony as Niku experienced a heart attack a couple of weeks ago. We prayed for him, and the doctors sent him home same afternoon in tears because of the miracle that God did in Nuku's body. Nuku, it's good to see you this morning. So nice to have you with us. And um, can we give God praise for that? Come on, the Lord is a miracle working God. <laughs> Despite the lockdown we've had, God is still performing miracles. And we wanna make a special mention to the Latham family who unfortunately this week lost Mary Latham. Some of you might remember Mary. Mary used to uh, come to church faithfully when she could and um, unfortunately passed away this week. So Jeff, Zuray, to your whole family, we're thinking about you guys, praying for you for peace and strength in this time, and just really with you in this time. And we will definitely miss Mary, was a wonderful, wonderful member of our church, and really faithful, and a good granny and a good mom uh, to you, Jeff. God bless you guys. We're gonna hand over to Pastor Richard. Hello, hello everyone. So nice to have you with us. Um, I want to say a few things. First of all, I want to extend my condolences to Jeff. Um, his mom passed away. Um, our thoughts and prayers are with you, Jeff, and your family. Um, then secondly, I want to remind everybody that um, Connect Group Leaders Meeting is this Tuesday at quarter to seven till 7.25. We trust. <laughs> we hope, um, I will only want to, I would like it to only be 40 minutes uh, so that if you run a connect group on a Tuesday, you can still run it and still get together. So I want to encourage you to please be there. And then lastly, there's a big power failure across the city today. So I need you to get, I need you to get the, um, this link out. And the best way to do that is to take the YouTube link and post it in your status in, on WhatsApp or on Facebook in your stories. So take your phone out now, please, guys, and online. Please post this link on your status or in your stories. I see lots of people not taking out their phones. Come on. And if while you're there, please subscribe to our channel, um, Word of Aether SA. But let's post it. Let's Let's be evangelists. Let's get the word out. Now, I've been preaching a, a, a series that I, I think is, is, 
I, and I say this humbly, maybe not, actually, uh, humbly, and I think this is, in a, the, 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 what I've been teaching you is quite remarkable. This is probably the last week of the series, unless the Lord gives me something else on this. I'm moving on to other things next week. But um, we've been talking about seeing and how you look at something, but you don't see it. Now, if you look at something, what do you, what do you use to look at something? Your eye. And so today we're talking about the eye and the role of the eye in seeing God, in understanding Him, in, in getting who He is. So, we, so seeing is believing. So when, you, when, when your eyes are open, then you believe, then you see, then you understand, you grasp who God is. Now, I want to read you... Um, a bit of, of Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 7, verse 20 to 23. And, and this is Jesus speaking, and he, and he said, What comes out of a man that, that defiles a man, for, within, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, etc., etc., an evil eye. I see people's heads shot up and looked to see whether I was telling the truth. An evil eye. What comes out of a man, comes from within, is an evil eye. What's an evil eye? You thought it was some sort of occult thing or something. Am I right? Comes out of the Bible. People have evil eyes. You may even have an evil eye. So let's find out what, what this is. So before that, I want to do a bit of an introduction so that you can grasp what I'm going to be speaking about. So now, these are two very famous pictures. The one, do you see the dress there? Now, to me, that is blue and charcoal. But there are lots of people here and around the world who have seen this dress as white and gold. Now, who here sees it as white and gold? There. Okay. Anyone, anyone else? Uh, where? Yeah, Michael, he sees it as white and gold. I don't understand how you can see a dress that's blue and black as white and gold. I promise you, they, they're not lying. They really are seeing it that way. Um, it's Nike one as well. I see it as green and gray, but it's actually pink and white. They see it. Who here sees the, the Nike as pink and white? Online. Pink and white or green and gray? To me, it's so obviously green and gray, I can't understand. Is, is the family defi divided? <laughs> the family is divided. You see green and gray, and you two see pink and white. We'll so you'll sort it out later, okay. <laughs> Now, I know a lot of you are battling, thinking, no ways. There's no ways. Who else here sees it as pink and, uh, pink and white? Everyone else, you see it as green and gray. Yeah, pink and white as well. Okay. So, <laughs> a dress can't be blue and, blue and black. And white and gold at the same time, can it? Come on, talk to me. You need to be polite. If I ask you a question, talk to me. Come on, online as well. Can a dress be blue and black and white and gold at the same time? 
No, it can't. So what I'm trying to say is, is that your eye has a lot, has, has, has a great effect in interpreting what you see. Can I, shall I freak you out? Do you know that you live in a colorless world? There's no such thing as color. What happens is, is that a wavelength comes, hits your eye, and your brain then applies color to it. <laughs> Promise you. There is no such thing as color. That's why different people, because different people are seeing different wavelengths, and their brain is applying different colors to it. So color is literally in your mind. That's why people are colorblind. Their, their, their brain that isn't as good at applying color to the world. So color is literally in your head. You're staring at me. <laughs> am, I, am I freaking you out? Good, I'm, I'm trying to freak you out. <laughs> Let me be clear. My goal is to freak you out. If I am not freaking you out, then I'm not doing my job. You see, what I'm trying to say is, is that we tend to think of the world as objective. But what happens, the way we see the world is hugely dependent on us. So you are literally, as, as I look here, you are literally applying color to everything, which is why racism is so stupid. There's no, everyone's, there's no such thing as color. We apply color to people's the pigment of their skin according to the wavelength that we receive. So color is in our heads. So let's have a look at this. So have, have I convinced you that you have a big role in how you see the world? In other words, that it's a lot of how you see the world comes from you. Let me give you another quick example. You, if, if you drew a house right now, if I said draw a house, most of you would draw a block with a door, two windows, and a, and a roof, like a triangle roof. Am I right? When last have you seen a house that looks like that? Have you ever seen a house that looks like that? Yet, if I told you to draw a house, that's what you would draw. That's the concept that you have of a house in your head. So, let's have a look at the scripture. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is un unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. So you can look at the world in an evil way with, and, and, and see the world through darkness. And you can look at the world through light and see light. How you see the world depends on what sort of eye you have. Do you have a good eye or do you have an evil eye? And this is, this is why, if you read through Judges, how Israel failed and failed the book of Judges, I think it's the sixth book of the seventh book of the Bible. They fail again and again and again, and Israel turns into a mess. Why? Because each, everyone did was what was right in their own eyes. So each one 
saw the world through there. Some saw it through the evil, evil eyes. Some saw it through good eyes. Some saw it through evil and good eyes. But the bottom line is, is that the bottom line is, is that everyone did what they felt was right through what they saw. And this is, um, and, and I want to even go further and I want to show you that a lot of whether you have an evil eye or a good eye is how generous you are. So, be careful that there's no mean-spirited thought in your heart, such as, this, such as the seventh year, the year of release of debt is near, and your eye is malicious towards your poor brother, and you give him nothing, then you will cry out to the Lord again, then he may cry out to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. So one of the best ways to see whether you have an evil eye, sound seems to be going on and off here. I don't know if it's in the congregation as well. But one of the best ways to see whether you have an evil or a good eye is are you generous or not? If you hold on to your money and you squeeze your cheetahs that they cry, your rhinos that they dehorned, then, then you have an evil eye. Why? Because you look at your brother and you see him as someone that can be exploited. What's in your heart produces whether you have an evil or good eye or not. So why is this whole I thing so important? In Genesis 3 verse 5 it said, God knows very well that the instant you eat it, you will become like him. For your eyes will be opened and you will be able to distinguish good from evil. So in the garden what happened is, they took the fruit And from that point on, it was up to their eye where, how they acted. Because until then, they had closed eyes, and they saw the world through God's eyes. But now every one of us, because of Adam and Eve, see the world how? We see the world through what? We see the world through our own eyes. Why? Because our eyes are open. And so we look at a situation, so someone will look at a situation and say, that's a poor brother, I need to look after him and care for him. Or we look at the situation and, and there's a sucker that I can exploit. We look at the same situation, one says, I can exploit this guy, I can take from him what he already has, what he, the little bit that he has. And another one says, he has so little, I need to help him. And it depends on your eye how you see, how you act. Because we act on what we see. Let me give you a good example. How many of you have ducked for a shadow? A shadow. You know, a shadow flashes by and you're, oh, it was a shadow. Am I right? Were you in any danger? No. Shadow doesn't hurt you. Shadow cannot hurt you. But the, the, the flash of the shadow, you perceive as a danger. Were you in any danger whatsoever? Well, only a whiplash from whipping your neck out of the way so fast. So we see, we see stuff and we act on it. So the question isn't what's going on. The question is how our eye perceives it. Do we see it through God's eyes? Do we see it through a good eye? Or do we see it through an evil eye? <clears throat> and I'm going to give you an example of what I'm speaking about. How did Eve fall? The woman was convinced um, 
the woman was convinced that she saw that the tree was she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her so she took some of the fruit and ate it so let's think about it she saw if she hadn't seen she would never have taken that fruit so she looked at it through her eyes saw that it was good and did it and and this is the this is the strategy that this is the strategy that that satan follows again and again what does it say it says for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure a craving for everything we everything we everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions so one of the three great strategies that the devil uses is what it's what you see the king james version called it what the lust of the flesh the sorry the lust of the eye so what i, I uh, the, the way that our eyes work is the following. So I'm going to show you something in Hebrew. Now the word iniquity is it's it's sin, transgressions, uh, sin and iniquity is the three steps up the ladder of badness. Sin is transgression is when you do something you don't really know it's wrong. Sin is when you know it's wrong and you do it. And transgression is, uh, and iniquity is when it becomes a habit. It's who you are and what you do. Now, the Hebrew alphabet was, the Hebrew alphabet was a pictorial alphabet. So they first had, instead of writing, they just put pictures. And then it started to become more of, more, a little bit more abstract. And, and so I'm going to show you in, in Hebrew writing now. That the, the, and you always read Hebrew from when? Right to left. So, the first symbol means your eye. This is the word in pretty, avon. <laughs> um, avon cosmetics, no. Avon means iniquity in Hebrew. So your eye is hooked, is hooked again, and so it continues. So what your eye gets hooked on multiplies. That's what iniquity is. What your eye focuses on multiplies and gets more and more and more. That's what iniquity is. So what our eye gets hooked on depends on how we behave. So if you keep looking at something, you will eventually become that. That's why it's so important to stay away from, from pornography. When you, or, or whatever it is that you battle with, if your eye gets hooked on it, it will get more and more and more. So what you look at is what you become. If you look at sin, you will become a sinner. Now, he, so they, I've talked a lot about having an evil eye, but let's see what a good eye looks like. For he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he will give of his bread to the poor. So if you have a generous eye, you will be generous, you will be kind, you will be godly. 1 Timothy 3 verse 5. 5 verse 21 says, I solemnly command you in the presence of, the, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ and of the holy angels. I'm going to teach you a principle now. Why are angels holy? Do you know? I guess that's what I'm here for. So 1 Timothy, um, oh, that's actually wrong. I, it's, it's, it's Revelation 3. I apologize for that. It says, Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over 
all over with eyes inside and out, day after day and night after night. So that what have they got on their wings? They've got eyes. So they're in the throne room of God, and, and day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. So why are they holy? Remember I taught you what your eye hooks on multiplies? What, what are they looking at day and night? A holy God. As they look on him, they become holy. So angels are holy not because they were made holy. They are holy because they Look on a holy God all the time. They're going, holy, 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 holy. They become holy. You, if your eye hooks onto God, on the the holy God, you are going to become holy because what your eye hooks on multiplies. The more you look at a holy God, the more holy you are. The more you look at other things, the more you become like that. What you focus on, your energy flows, what your eye looks at is what you become. So, And that's why Paul taught us, keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he, he knew would be his afterwards. And now he sits on the place of honor by the throne of glory. So you, if you look at Jesus, you see his incredible sacrifice. You see his victory over sin and the devil. You see him in a place of rulership next to the Father. If you look at those four things all the time, what is going to happen? You're going to have victory over sin. You're going to be willing to sacrifice. You're going to understand that he, that. Because of Jesus sitting on a throne of authority, you have authority and power. And you're going to understand that you're the child of the Father. Those four things, if you focus on that, that will transform your life. It will transform who you are because what you look at, what your eye hooks on, multiplies to you. Now, this is the verse, uh, the, first, the first time I ever preached, I preached on this verse. And it's Revelation 3, verse 16 to 18. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And you say, I'm rich, I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're, watch, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So he's talking about the Laodiceans. Laodiceans, how do they see themselves? They see themselves as rich. Everything I want, I don't need a thing. How does God see them? He sees them as poor and blind and naked. The exact opposite of the way they see themselves. And so I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will, be ashamed. you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. Now, if you look at the total problem of the Laodiceans, what was their problem? Their problem was that they didn't see properly. Each of us need to make sure that we see properly. For instance, let's go back to that dress. Some of you saw it as, as, as blue and black, and some of you saw it as white and gold. One set of you was wrong. can't remember which set, actually. <laughs> but I think it was actually the white and gold. What? So most of you saw blue and black, black, am I right? I, I, I think, and I must check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, that you guys were all wrong. You saw the wrong thing. 
Another good example, the, 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 the Nike stuff, green and charcoal, the green and gray. That was actually pink and white. Most of you saw green and gray, am I right? You saw the wrong thing. What your eyes saw wasn't actually what was really there, what was happening. And if you've got that problem in the supernatural or the spiritual, you're in big trouble because you look at yourself and you say, oh, I'm okay. God looks at you and you, you, you look at yourself and say, oh, I'm great, great clothes, God, everything is great. But if you look at yourself through God's eyes, he may see you as naked, just looking for it, wretched and miserable. So what is the big, what is the thing that changes us? It's our eyes. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, you need an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. Now, that word ointment literally means, and I went and had a look at it because I thought, well, this is the cure to our problems. This is how we solve our problem of not seeing clearly. We went and had a look. A lot of people interpreted it as medicine and all of that. But literally, it was like a cake of flour or bread that they used to put over their eyes. That's what it is. Now, what is bread? In the Bible. What's bread? Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Bread represents Jesus, represents the word. Jesus was the word, the logos. Let's look at what the logos means. It means anyone who listens to my teaching, logos, and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. So logos is the teachings of Jesus, and we get that primarily through the Bible, but we also get it through prophecy and things like that, and God. But it's, it's, the, it's the, the Word of God. And we look at the Word of God, and what do we do? We put that word on our eyes. The more you read the Bible, the more you, you, what, you, you build, the more you look at the Bible, the more that you build yourself up, the more your eyes are going to start to open and you're going to see more accurately. The more you look at the Word of God, the more you get the Word of God into the Spirit, the more your eye problem can be solved. God wants you to have your eye problem solved. And the way to do that is to put the bread on your eyes again and again and again. So that your eyes can be opened and you can see. But, and when that happens, you get the rhema. What's the rhema? What's the rhema? The rhema is... The word made alive in the spirit. And so the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. The very words Rhema I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And so we, we had an incredible move of God many years ago with Rodney Howard Brown. And lots of people got touched by the Holy Spirit. But lots of people got touched and fell away. The people that whose lives it was transformed had been putting the word of God on their eyes again and again. When that rhema came, it transformed them. So what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to explain to you guys today is that we need to get the word of God into our hearts, into our minds, so that we can see properly. Because when we see properly, we look at Jesus and we see him for who he is. It's a process. I've been speaking to you about the, that God is not just something in a book, that he's experiential, that you can experience God, that you can 
you, that you can experience him in spirit and in truth. In the same way, what I'm here to tell you to do, though, is to fill your heart, your mind, everything with the Word of God. That will, tr- that will heal your eyes. And when your eyes are healed, you will experience Jesus. You will see Him for who He is in your life. Savior, Messiah, healer, provider. When you, get, when you heal your eyes, if you look on Jesus, you're going to see Him for who He is. And it will transform your life. So, since it says, uh, Colossians 3.1, it says, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I want, you to, I want to tell you today, you need to focus in on who? On Jesus. Every day, focus in on his word. And when you get into a service like that or a time by yourself, and you're praying and worshiping God, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to receive a revelation of who God is. And that's how it is. I want you not to, to have a relationship with some distant spirit in the sky. I've preached this to you to say that in worship, if you filled your eyes, if you put the bread of life on your eyes again and again, when you get into worship, your heart is going to be open and you're going to see Jesus for who he is. Now I want to give an an opportunity here for people who say, wow, I'd never understood that I could experience Jesus, that he's here with me, that he can touch me, he can change me, that he wants to be with me. If you you haven't, haven't made the decision to open your heart to Jesus so he can heal your eyes, if you've got an eye problem in the spirit, you've never understood who Jesus is, I want to pray for you and pray for your eyes your spiritual eyes, that they can be opened. If you want to be included in that prayer, both online or yeah, online I want you to type, it's me. I want so that you can be included in the prayer to have your eyes opened, your spiritual eyes opened. If it's not, if, if you are here in this congregation, I want you Everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to raise your hand and say, include me in the prayer. Raise your hand up to say, I want to be prayed for. My spiritual, I see eyes, hands going up. I want my eyes opened. I want to see Jesus for who he is. Jesus is the, is, is, will transform your life. Online, type, it's me, it's me. I want to, to include you in the prayer. Can everyone stand up? There are lots of people who've raised their hands. I want you to come here and, st- and come and stand in front of me. I want to pray for you. I want to help you. Please come down. A whole bunch up there, come down over there. Come down, stand here and face me. I want to pray for you. If you're lady, please bring your handbag or whatever you have with you. Because we want to pray for you. And look after you. And if, if it's... Thank you, sir. And if it's if it's you, if it's you, I want your eyes to be opened. If you are online and it said it's me, I need you to message us on 067003 5623. Gonna repeat that. 067 5623. Come and stand here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. I need altar workers for each of these people. Please come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I need people, please, to come and altar work. Come and pray for We're going to get people to pray with you, help you, uh, explain what you've, the decision that you've made, what God wants for you, the goodness and graciousness of God. We need two gentlemen, please, three gentlemen. 
altar workers, please, I need guys. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Please step in. We need another. If you're, if you're an altar worker at all, I need help here, please. With men. I need one more man. Thank you, Lord. I need one more guy. Okay. While I'm doing this, please message us. If you, it was you on online, 067-003-56623. And I'm going to pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that your eyes, our eyes will be opened, that we will receive you, that we will, Lord, that, that you won't be just some idea in the sky, but that you will be Emmanuel, God with us. I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you are going to transform these men and women. I pray, Father God, that you have a plan and purpose for them. And I ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to transform them and make yourself real to them in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've got people with you. We've got people with you that, um, that want to pray with you. And I want you guys to go through, um, go through that way. They're going to lead you. Um, into an altar work, an area where we can pray for you and help you. Please, please come with, go with the altar workers. We want you to see your life transformed. I'm going to hand over to the studio. Wow, praise the Lord. We just want to thank the Lord for all the people that came forward this morning. But what especially just touched my heart as they were coming forward was half of them were young people. And there's a group of boys that came forward who we know come every Sunday morning. They come from across um, the William Moffat Expressway where the church is from over Barkins and Fairview. And they come to church faithfully every week. And yeah, they were coming forward for prayer. Isn't God awesome? Isn't this so awesome to see this younger generation come through? And Mike, anything you want to share that, before we close off? take it from a young guy who's on the internet often checking these things out. <laughs> I think this is the other thing. People think if they haven't booked by Sunday morning, they can't get in. There is still space. Yep. So please don't hesitate coming. Um, we've seen videos of churches where people are literally pushing the gates down, fighting with people to get into church. We would rather have people pushing gates down to get into church than not come. So please come. There is space. If you haven't booked, it's not too late. But I also just want to end off with this. We've got a powerful, powerful series that we're doing in the youth ministry at the moment. God laid on our hearts to get the young people to speak and share their testimonies. This month in Fresh Fire Youth, we've got a theme we are calling Second Chances, a Godumentary. Especially in the last year or so, we've been seeing a lot of young people see what's happened after this pandemic with the lockdown that happened, even maybe possibly, in fact, we know some young people who've seen uh, loved ones pass away. And a lot of young people are asking the question, where is God? Where is God in the, month, in the midst of all of this? And so what we've done for this month is we're getting the young people to share their testimonies. Real people with real problems, but are seeing a real God come with real answers. Amen. 
And so I would like to encourage every person. Uh, I know that most of you sitting here or you're at church, you're a little bit, you're old, you're past the youth age. But I'd like you all to please go ahead and subscribe to our youth's YouTube channel, which is called Fresh Fire Youth. Fresh space fire space youth. You can go look at our videos. Amy Johnson shared a powerful, powerful testimony. It's a five minute video clip, but we would love you to please go and subscribe, go check the video and go and share it because it is touching so many young people's lives. There, were, there was over a hundred young people who came on Friday night because they want to hear about young people their age who are experiencing God in a real, real way. So please go and check out our YouTube channel go and watch that video and go and share it with as many people as possible. I think the more people can hear testimonies and stories of God's goodness, the more this world will change. Amen? Amen. Amen. You've all got a story and it needs to be shared. And this service needs to be shared too. So please keep sharing. And we're going to go into one more worship uh, song before we close off.
Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just saw a funny picture there just this morning, I think. I saw it on Word of Faith's Instagram page where everyone's following you on Instagram, usually tells you when someone follows you. Well, this morning, I wanna tell you, you got two new followers this morning on your page, and that was goodness and mercy. Goodness started following you, mercy started following you. That's all that counts, amen. So, babes, this morning, I think, yeah, just if we, let's, as we close off, you can just pray, pray a prayer over the families and the children as we welcome them back in. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to just come and worship you. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that, that you'll go with each and every family who has attended, each and every family who's watching. I thank you, Father, that you're with us. And Lord, I thank you that you're drawing families back into church, Father. I thank you that wherever they're listening, wherever they are, Father, your Holy Spirit is drawing them back in. And I thank you, just like Matthew said, for your goodness and your mercies to follow each and every one of us all the days of our lives. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. So please don't be scared. Please come. As you've been hearing on the news, the numbers have been dropping. Isn't God so good where people thought there was going to be a third wave? Amen. There ain't no third wave. There's only a wave of the Holy Spirit. Come and join us in church. It's not too late to join us at 10 a.m. God bless you guys.